And they tore the building down and scattered all these kind of small businesses that were cool and interesting and thriving. So that some condos could be built up, but then it just never happened and it became that gross empty lot. And with complete disregard and disrespect towards those businesses and business owners who had done so much to make that space what it was. Maybe people thought that it was too old looking and it needed a, you know, a new face or something. I don't know. I'm assuming it was in the name of progress. The same thing that happened to everything else in Sugar House and that happens everywhere else in Salt Lake, which is, for whatever reason, people want new beige stucco buildings, not like old groovy buildings from the 60s or 70s. Whoever owned it decided that redeveloping it was a more profitable way of going um, than keeping the random shops. And finally, under a lot of pressure from the municipalities at play, they filled in the hole with a little bit of dirt, and that's what it is now. It's a big, empty dirt lot. The property owner had never communicated with the city or anyone else about what the possibilities of staying, uh, staying erect until it was time to build a new building. The property owner hadn't communicated with the city, was fearful that the city would make him restore the property in, in a historic nature. And it's a shame that he had to shuttle the nine or ten small businesses that were there to other places. To be transplanted to someplace else takes, you need to move your customer base, you need to do more marketing, and it's very expensive. And um, so th I'm one of the few, there's two or three of us that were able to be transplanted and grow someplace else. Uh, the sad part of it was we, we pleaded with the city. We had several city meetings with neighbors, neighboring businesses, the property owner, and the city. Uh, to allow us to stay there. You know, every time you make a decision like that in our city, it has tremendous ripple effects, and it's going to be for generations. Those property owners, people who are wealthy, people who have a lot of clout, people who can help buy elections, uh, too often they get their way because everybody else just sits back and resigns themselves and says, well, I don't have the money, I don't have the power, so what can I do about it? There's plenty you can do if you get out and stand up and, and raise hell about it. It's a powerful uh, uh, ability that we have as neighbors to carve the, the street that we live on. But it's got to be tenacious. It's got to be sustained. It can't be everybody comes to one city council meeting, vents their spleens, and then goes home, and, and then they say, oh, nobody listened to us. Um, you're not going to be heard unless you're just, you keep at it. You show up everywhere the mayor shows up, you show up everywhere the council shows up, you let them know that there's going to be a cost if they don't listen to you. If they want to have the, the large big boxes, then that's, that's how they're making that decision is by shopping at the big boxes. But if they make a conscious effort to shop with their neighbors and the local businesses, they will be able to help sustain that. And it's, it's a matter of individual choices that we make
to create the community and the neighbor that we want to live in. I mean, where do you send people when they come to this city? You don't want to, you're certainly not going to send them up to the strip mall kinds of places up fourth south. Uh, this city, like so many other cities around the country, is becoming one of those look-alike places, indistinguishable. Is there anything we can do? There's a lot that can be done. You'd be amazed at what the squeaky wheel can accomplish in city government. I did a lot of my clothes shopping at Pips Clothing Exchange, which, you know, has moved and still exists, but there was something about it in that location that I, you know, could afford to buy a pair of jeans there and I could find some cool clothes. I didn't have any money, of course, being in college. And I think I got a tattoo in a tattoo shop there once. Orion's Music was a great mom and pop's record shop where you could find cool records, all kinds of genres. If you wanted to hear a record, they would put it on throughout the store. Like they would set up speakers and put it on. It was just one of those great, you know, mom and pop shops that you could walk in and felt like they were like, hey, how's it going today? And it was very neighborhoody. It felt like high fidelity. I'd either be at Sugar House Coffee or at the Lucky Pirate Denim Bar because I knew the owner. I really appreciated the Free Speech Zone because they offered like a political political place, you know, where you could come. It was, I mean, it was politics, but it was also just opinions, and it was kind of that radical side of freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom of the people. You're going to interview the, what's his name, the Meekum. property owner, Meekum? He declined an interview. 